Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy to be able to bring people back together for our Safe Baby, Safe Kids Task Force, even if it is virtually. And I think just in the last week or 10 days since we've been looking forward to this, you really could not have turned on the TV or picked up a newspaper without hearing some mention of the things we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so I think this is incredibly timely. You know, as most of you know, who've been here before, the goal of our task force is to look at how do we improve the health and welfare of kids from birth to college. And that has covered an enormous range of things that we have looked at from some of the very practical things around car seats and swimming pools to the much more complicated issues that are confronting kids. And obviously what we've all been through over the last year with the pandemic has really changed that focus. And one of the pieces that we've been looking very hard at throughout this past year are the mental health needs of kids. We know, for instance, that while there may have been a shortages, shortage in all types of mental health services during the pandemic, that was particularly true for kids. We routinely saw kids across the county who were in need of services, who were spending 48, 50 hours in an emergency room waiting for services. That kind of shortage has an impact. In addition, we wanna be looking at the prevention piece. And we know the statistics, you know, one in four individuals will experience some type of mental or neurological disorder over their lifetime. And it's estimated that 75% of mental health conditions develop before the age of 25. And most of you are here today have continued to hear us talk about the work in that situation and particularly around what it has meant for young adults with issues that their parents are trying to transition them into living independently and how that's going and what kind of services there are and are not. It has informed many of the pieces of legislation that we have filed. It's informed, for instance, this past October, we looked at what was happening to kids, whether they were in school in person or in hybrid, and how were they being affected by bullying. And we partnered with the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center for a training with the special focus on cyberbullying, because while kids were out, living their whole lives as we all were online, it just dramatically increased the kind of things that were happening on that platform. And then we also looked at the first responders across our county and how they were dealing with their own kids and what it meant for their kids when their parents were going off to work in situations where every TV, every radio ad was screaming were dangerous. And how could they cope with that? Mom and dad leave every day. They maybe can't come home because they're staying somewhere else. They, we've got to take all kinds of precautions. I'm scared they're going to get sick. We hosted a conversation about how parents could be talking to kids, mitigating trauma, and what tools they could be using to deal with the stress and anxiety in their house. And that has really led us to today. We've heard a lot from our partners in education over the last year that the inconsistencies we've seen with regard to in-person and remote le learning, how both sides, the educators and the kids were struggling with not seeing each other in person. Um, and what was happening in terms of increases in child abuse when kids were not being seen by the adults that we trust to make those reports, the cyberbullying that I mentioned, and most critically, the increase in attempts and successful um, completion of someone taking their life through suicide, young people. So it is my great pleasure to have with us today um, from the Clay Center at Mass General, Dr. Kenjita Watkins, and I'm sorry if I slipped okay. over that name, Doctor, who is the Associate Director of the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds at Mass General. 
and the Associate Director of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Residency Program at the Mass General and McLean's. In addition, Dr. Watkins provides clinical care to children, adolescents, and families in the child outpatient clinic and continues to teach and supervise fellows, residents, and medical students. Um, I think if you had a chance to look at some of the articles that we sent you about the Clay Center, they are just doing amazing work. And when we talk about people who've been on the forefront during the last 15 months or so, they were people at the Clay Center have certainly been doing that. So Dr. Markets, we're really happy to have you here today. Um, and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be able to talk to, to the group about um, this continued and ongoing conversation about supporting our kids during COVID and, and even as COVID changes or, or the situation around us change. So I'm going to share my screen. And, and so I'm Khadija Booth Watkins, and I'm again glad to be here with you all today. And so I'm just going to go through my slides. And if I'm going too fast, I have a tendency to talk fast. Um, let me know, and I will slow down. And anything that we need to or you want to go back to at the end, I'm happy to do so as well. Um, so just to say, I have no disclosure. I'm making no money from pharmacies or any other industries. Um, and you talked a little bit about who we are, and thank you for for highlighting the things that we're doing. We do a lot of great things and, and, our, and at the core, we're devoted to supporting and promoting the mental health um, and emotional well-being of, of young people. And, and we're, we're essentially an educational vehicle. We don't provide clinical care, but there's a lot of great resources on our website um, to support caregivers and even some things that can support some of the young people as they navigate through, through life. So basically we're here because we've had quite the year or at this point, year and a half with the COVID pandemic. And, and I guess I'll say reckoning on race, which probably is not accurate because we haven't really gotten a handle on it, but everything that's going on with related to race and injustice and, and everything else in terms of the polarization and the, and the election. And then we also have Juneteenth, which has also been a big uh, moment for, for the African-American community as well. So there's been a lot of low lights but a lot of but there have been some highlights and some silver linings as along the way but uh, but it really has taken um a great toll on so many of adults um and the adults are the ones who have to care for kids so i'm going to spend a little bit of time um talking about that specifically because almost half of the adults have reported being negatively affected through the pandemic with feeling uh, increased tension feeling angry and on edge uh snapping mood swings and and that tends to lead to yelling at, at people that we love and we care about. And I expect that 17% number is kind of low. Um, and when I, we think about why the emotional toll, uh, there's been so much grief and loss and whether that's loss of um, you know, a loved one or, or loss of health and ability to function, loss of jobs, uh, kids have lost you know, connections with peers and their academics and all of the things that comes with school with respect to extracurriculars and sports. And then there's been so much fear and uncertainty about what's gonna happen and, and, and the unknown, leaving people to feel anxious and, and hopeless. Um, and then again, the isolation has just created an incredible sense of loneliness. Um, and so how do we support our kids? We gotta think about what do they wanna know and what, do they, what are they asking of us? Um, they wanna know really, are they safe? Um, are you safe? The people who are caring for, for them, are they safe? Um, and, and really, you know, as kids will, how does this affect me? How is this gonna affect my life? Um, and even as we think about that, some of the, the older kids, as they get ready to prepare for college, like, are they gonna be able to go on campus? Will they be able to join a fraternity or sorority? There's so many questions they have um, about things that they've been looking forward to for, for quite some time that have been kind of taken from them or, or, or altered in some way in terms of uh, it doesn't look the way that they had hoped it would look. Um, and so, so questions that maybe grandparents and other caregivers have really tend to fall into the categories of 
when do they need to start to worry? Um, what kind of things indicate that your kid or is, is stressed or having anxiety or is depressed? And then once you begin to worry, what do you do about it? And so that's really where, where the questions, uh, what, what actions are you taking next now that you're concerned about your child? So how do we support our kids? It really will start with the, with the notion of taking care of yourself. And there's been a lot of talk about self-care and uh, meditation, but ultimately we, we're gonna have to spend some time thinking about and talking about how do we take care of ourselves? So what's your self-care plan? What did you do to take care of yourself today? Um, what are you gonna do to take care of yourself tomorrow? Uh, what does self-care look like? And really it looks different for everybody. And there's this image that comes to my mind when I think of self-care of someone you know, sitting, meditating, looking, uh, looking like they're in a spa. And that may not be self-care for you. And you may not have time to do, um, you know, 30, 45 minute meditation. So really it boils down to what does self-care look for you? What is going to recharge your battery and what's going to keep you feeling that you're balanced? So some of the things that, that are, are key is making sure that we realize, I think, you know, and you'll see this again, that we're, we're meant to be around other people we're not the only one struggling at this moment. And someone surely is struggling with something similar to, to what you are. And so asking for help and talking to people, uh, friends uh, about what, what they've done. It, this problem may have already been solved. So, so sometimes there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So really asking for help, um, setting limits, uh, being able to say no to things, like your plate's too full. Uh, this has been really, really hard. So being kind to yourself, there's a lot of guilt around maybe not being able to spend enough time with your kids or maybe not being feeling equipped to be able to help them with the remote schooling. Um, maybe you didn't get to take a, a vacation, but really just being kind to yourself and, and, and acknowledging that this has been a tough year and things aren't as they normally are. And it's okay that things look a little bit different and we won't be able to do all the things that we used to do or in the way that we used to. Um, making sure you set aside some time for yourself um, and really ask for what you need. So I'm gonna go through a series of these, but the point is in terms of self-care, what happens when you don't take care of yourself? What happens when you don't water the plant? They, they wither, um, they don't thrive. Similarly, you get this brand new car, what happens when you don't maintenance it? Or, or even if you forget to put gas in it, you end up on the side of the road with a car that has um, malfunctioned. And then lastly, because I just got carried away, you know, what happens, and I'm sure we've all done this, when you forget to charge their phone, or even worse, you put your phone on the charger, but for some reason it didn't connect and it didn't charge, your battery dies. And so we're no different. You know, we need to take time and recharge and refuel. Um, and there are some myths out there about self-care, uh, but self-care is not a luxury, it's not optional. Taking care of yourself doesn't mean you're selfish. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive. It's not time consuming. It's not only for women and it's not automatic. Um, and I think the not automatic and it's not a one-time thing are, are really important because like so many things, life gets busy. And if we don't deliberately make a, make a conscious effort to engage in self-care and make it a routine and a habit, uh, it won't happen. And so really that, that to me are the two most important take home points about self-care is that it has to be deliberate and it has to be an ongoing habit that we develop. So what else can you do to support your kids? Um, the other big thing after, in addition to taking care of yourself is controlling your own anxiety. So get information, stay informed, but manage how much information you, you're receiving. Um, it can't be helpful to be inundated with the same information over and over again, or watching the same clips on TV over and over again. Um, again, going back to talking to other people to get support and to stay connected, making time for yourself, setting priorities, um, get out of the house and get out of the house in a way that's safe and that's responsible and be honest and be honest with your kids. Um, it's hard to have conversations and not be anxious about um, what you say if it's not the truth. The other thing that you can do is in terms of as you engage with your kids, ask what they know. You'll be surprised. They know a lot of, of information and they're hearing a lot of information all, often from many different resources, especially the older ones, whether they're hearing it from other friends, maybe parents of other friends, um, 
social media, news, and school. There, there are tons of outlets as to where they can get their information. So it's really important to know where they're getting their information from. And then it's also important to validate their, their feelings and concerns. This, this will allow you to um, connect with them and then also provide an opportunity to correct any misconceptions or any false information that they, that they have. Um, and similar to self-care, this is typically these conversations aren't single conversations. These conversations are frequent. And so creating a space so that these conversations can happen naturally, um, frequently over time and empower them by modeling. So you showing them that you're taking care of yourself uh, is important. You showing them how you manage and navigate stressful situations is important because they are absolutely watching everything that we do. They're listening to, to everything that we say, um, even when they pretend to not be. Kids need to feel reassured. So it's important for us to provide reassurance. And some ways that you can do this is um, through family narratives and talking about how the strength of your family or maybe how you've overcome something. Um, you know, sometimes families have stories about how they came from very humble beginnings and, and achieved, uh, you know, the current status. But, so, but really talking about the family narrative and, and pulling out the strengths really can encourage uh, resilience. Um, Structure is really important. It gives kids uh, basically uh, walls or, or boundaries so that they can function. If we think about why so many kids do well at school, it's because of the, the structure. They know where they need to be, when they need to be there, you know, what's coming next, and it gives them an opportunity to plan and, and think ahead. Um, there, there's a lot of things that you can do through creative, creative expression and arts. Um, so drawing, journaling, writing, those things are all helpful. Um, and really support and encourage peer contact. There was a period of time where kids couldn't see one another, but there are other ways that they can engage with one another. And so supporting that is really important for connection and resilience. And then again, going back to self-care, self-care is for everyone. So encouraging your kids to take care of themselves and engage in some of those self-care activities, helping them to explore what activities help them uh, feel better and recharged. So what do we do with the preschool kids? Um, this is a little bit different because um, we have to think about them developmentally in terms of what they might be thinking, you know, what they and what they can understand. So they're closely connected to us in a way that is not saying for the older kids where they're more kind of peer connected. Uh, so they, they're more responsive to our emotions. And, and so that's why it's important for us to manage our own emotions. Um, take time to play and, and have fun and cuddle. Uh, really, it's important to manage their media access to what's going on in the world around them um, and pay attention to what you say around them because it's easy to have conversations, whether on the phone or you know, with a friend and, and not be aware that the little one is listening because I, I will say again, they're always watching and they're always listening. Older kids are, are, are it gets a little bit easier in some ways because you can give them concrete explanations, provide the reassurance that we talked about earlier. Again, structure and routine is extremely important. Um, and at this point, they could also play. So allow them to kind of work things out through play uh, and don't get disturbed. Don't worry about things that they do over and over again. It's okay. Uh, at this stage, they might kind of appear to be acting and behaving in a way that's younger than they that they were acting maybe a year ago. And that's also okay. Um, it's been stressful. And sometimes when kids are faced with stress, they regress and they become a little bit more clingy. Uh, and similar for the, the, the younger kids, really limit their, their media access into what they're seeing. Teens, again, it becomes easier in some way and not so easy in another way because they are definitely have their own opinions. They, they're beginning to assert their autonomy and, and they wanna be heard and they wanna be understood. So those conversations are gonna to have to be more delicate. You're gonna to have to pay more attention to the words you use. And as important as the words you use are, is gonna be the body language because they're gonna be very sensitive to judgment and criticism. Um, at this stage, you could watch the media with them. I would still encourage you to, to limit it, um, but, but watch the media with them and discuss what's going on and, and, and hear how they're feeling about it and how they're processing it. Um, it's important at this stage because at this stage, as they're beginning to figure out who they are and, and who they want to be, um, the peers become much more important than the parents in terms of that process. So they're super connected to peers. Um, so this is really, you know, we talk a lot about a limiting screen time at this point because of the limitations around 
getting together, this is not really a time you really want to limit because this is really a vehicle that they use to still engage with their peers, whether it's video games or chatting, like texting or some of these other social media outlets. This is how they stay connected. Um, and maybe, you know, think about them as uh, problem solving partners. So they may have ideas about what they want to do to, to address things that are going on in the world around them. Think together with them, uh, problem solve together. Again, this builds resilience in terms of them being able to think through and critically think and see other perspectives. The pandemic base really just created this perfect storm. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what are some of the layers that happen or what, what happened. Um, but basically, they're more stressed and anxious and lonelier than ever. And this was actually happening prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic just exacerbated and, and accelerated those, those numbers. Suicide rates are going up. Um, and again, this also was happening before the pandemic, but the pandemic just really just made things skyrocket. And no one really knows why for sure, but a little bit later, we'll talk about some of the reasons why people believe that, that, that these things are going up or these numbers are going up. And some of these things are similar to what we talked about before, but a lot of the stress is really related to the uncertainty, just not knowing what's gonna happen, what school gonna look like, um, the grief and loss and the anticipated grief at, about things that are gonna be lost. Um, whether it's again, anticipated grief about whether we'll be able to keep our house or whether our, my parents will keep their job or whether I'll be able to go to college. Do I need to take a gap year? So there's so many things that they're worried about um, in the future that contributes to their stress. I highlighted transitions because transitions is, are, going to be a big thing, especially as we start to begin to think about, you know, many kids didn't go back to school until the very end. Uh, many kids were, were home the entire time. And there were some kids that, that went to school in person for the entire time. But transitioning is going to be a really big piece that we have to pay attention to. And we, we really shouldn't wait to the last minute to begin to think about transitioning and talking about transitioning back to school and, and college or, or wherever uh, you were before this all happened. Um, a lot of these other things are challenges, again, that we'll have to figure out, but the, the remote learning and how to balance work and having to teach kids, you know, math that doesn't look like the math that you learned how to do, um, not having adequate support at home to, to, to perform your job, which creates stress in the house, and then the disparities that, that were highlighted during COVID. COVID really highlighted the disparities um, and, and the gaping holes in, in the mental health uh, safety, safety network. Um, but the disparities were largely seen with the lower lower socioeconomic status, um, with the food insecurities and not being able to have internet to be able to access school um, and other resources. Uh, again, often the parents of, of these homes didn't have the same level of education, so they weren't able to really help their kids. Um, and then if there was a lack of, of, of English fluency, it also made it hard to, to support their kids during school and to even navigate the, the system and network with us. And, uh, coordinate and collaborate with the teachers. Um, the remote world also made it hard to, to collaborate with the teachers, um, coaches, and other supportive adults that maybe were in these kids' lives. Um, school served a, a huge purpose outside of just education. For, for many kids, it was a place where they went and felt safe, a place where they went and at least had two meals. Um, and not being able to be connected to those supportive adults was, was really hard for a lot of kids. Um, the social media thing is, is, is not really for certain, so we'll just skip over that. And then there were all these other factors that really added to the stress level. Um, and it all seemed to happen, although they have all been happening for some time, but it just all seemed to happen um, at rapid speed in a short period of time. And I think it had a lot to do with, with us all being home, you know, watching because we had nothing else that we were able to do, but the, the social unrest, the Me Too movement, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, it, it was all very stressful. And, and this generation of kids are very much activists and, and very, very, uh, very dedicated to justice and, 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 and advocating for themselves. One of the new worries that wasn't really such a worry before is really about, you know, will my kid uh, lose out on social emotional learning because they weren't in school? And so this is just a little graph that talks about about it, but the, but the short answer is, you know, they'll, they'll catch up. It really was just more of a delay as opposed to they, they, they're gonna miss out on some milestones. Um, 
some and some speculate that the, the loneliness and isolation in this this space of being remote and remote from school and from um, friends is what really exacerbated that sense of grief and loss. Um, and again, it goes back to there's so much that happens at school. Um, but but with that, we are seeing a lot of depression, um, which which for a lot of kids leads to a lot of suicidal thinking. Um, some of the signs that you would look for for kids to, to worry about if they're depressed is whether or not they're sleeping um, and, and seeing some of the consequences of sleep deprivation, which looks like um, could be irritability, it could be uh, poor concentration. Uh, kids are having a really tough time regulated, regulating their emotions. So things that used to maybe um, not be such a big deal, they, they really almost have a, a full on uh, tantrum about. Um, you'll, you'll see in terms of also and thinking about self-regulation from other standpoints, you could see uh, excessive eating, where we were seeing a lot of increase in substance abuse, uh, smoking, drinking. Um, and this has become a real problem. And so really thinking about how we're gonna, gonna uh, address this is, is gonna be something else we have to pay close attention to. Um, and then the medical problem. So, uh, you know, stress really can lead to significant medical problems. And we see that often uh, with respect to higher blood pressure, diabetes, the, 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 the hormones that are released in the body really predisposes us to, to really these things at a higher rate. And so I mentioned just a second ago about suicide and depression. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about suicide because it, it is another thing that has really, the numbers have really risen. And again, they were rising before COVID, but after COVID we really saw a significant increase. And um, like was mentioned earlier, there's been, the, the ERs have been flooded with kids who are in a really bad place in a way that we haven't seen before ever. Um, and so really just taking a moment to talk about suicide and, and really suicide prevention is gonna, gonna be important. Um, but it's been the 10th leading cause of, cause of death overall and, and has moved to being the number two cause of death uh, between the ages of 10 and 24, which is, which is, which is moving up from, from the third place. Um, and these are some of the statistics in terms of uh, methods that kids use to, to, to take their lives. And, and, I, and I will point out that, that it is, that number probably is falsely um, low or, or a little bit lower than it really is for children because typically when the, the data is collected for children, suicides are usually um, characterized as either injury, accidents or unintentional injury. And so really aren't really capturing the full breadth of how many younger kids are, are taking their lives. And so some of the reasons why people think rates are rising is, is the recession. And we know what you know income uh, challenges and poverty can do to a household and to, to, to a, um, a, a system um, in terms of jobs and food and the things we talked about earlier. The other thing that we are thinking that plays a huge role is really the limitations to care. And again, access to care is not anything new. Um, the cost of care has been prohibitive. Insurance coverage, you know, a lot of kids got services at school, whether it was occupational therapy and physical therapy, but they also got their, their, their counseling at school and they saw a therapist at school. And so that was a big loss when we went into this remote world. Similarly, when we think about our college age kids, a lot of them also got their services from school. And so once school, once they had to return home, you know, whether they did or didn't have uh, access, you know, Typically, services weren't able to be delivered across state lines, so they also lost their their support and their 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 um their treatment. And then the wait list. So thinking about trying to find a therapist or psychiatrist for for a child is is incredibly difficult. The wait lists are incredibly incredibly long at, at at all of the clinics, um, and the list can go on. Some of the other things that limit access to care is really the the lack of having um, interpreter services to, to meet the needs. Typically the kids can speak English, but the parents can. And so being able to navigate that system is difficult. Um, the stigma is, is huge. And I think, and, and in part, you know, there are not enough culturally and ethnically diverse providers to provide care. Um, and transportation has been another big one. Um, some of the other stressors that, that pretty much come from the other slide that I talked about with the climate change and the other things that they're worried about. Um, but parental stress also can't be ignored. And so going back to one of the super early slides where almost 50% of, of adults said that they were negatively impacted and they and I highlighted some of the things that they identified as things that were happening. Um, parental stress, you know, can really stress the system. And so again, kids feed off of our stress. 
if we're anxious, they know it and then it stresses them. And so that's really important why, that's why, really why it's so important for us to manage our own stress and to, to take care of ourselves. And the way to prevent suicide is to reduce the risk factors. Um, and suicide is complex. There are many layers. Um, well, but what's really important is four out of five kids who who attempt have given signs that they were having they were struggling prior to. So there's a there's a role here in a in a path to intervention. And really, we have to know the signs so that we can step in early. Uh, some of the risk factors are risk factors related to gender. So girls are more likely to attempt than boys, um, but boys are more likely to actually be successful at suicide attempts. Um, depression is higher, um, and and pre pubertal boys and girls. Um, so this is, again, just something to know so when you're thinking about and worried about what is my child. Um, and then kids uh, in the LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth are three times more likely to attempt suicide. And, and specifically, even if you break that down, uh, kids of color, African-American, Latino, Native American, Asian kids are um, have the highest rates. So, uh, so these are just some of the things that, that predisposes them to, to being at higher risk at baseline. Um, some of the some of these some of these statistics are, are really sad, especially when you think about kids who have been diagnosed with depression or anxiety who are not getting treated. Um, and when we look at the numbers, the rates have increased between 2007 and 2018 by 60 percent, and that's a huge number. And again most of the numbers for children, those you know, under 10 are, are reported as accidents or unintentional deaths. So that number is, is, is low. So it's not really accurately capturing the numbers for, for kids. Um, so these are, these are really, again, places for us to be able to intervene. Just to go over some of the risk factors. So there's some individual risk factors, which are having previous suicide attempts, uh, having mental illness, um, some of the psychosocial stressors about legal problems, uh, having lost jobs, kids who have serious medical problems are also at higher risk and substance use disorder. Um, some of the risk factors in terms of specifically mental, mental, mental health disorders, um, when you combine that with uh, what's going on in the media around a lot of these TV shows that really kind of sensationalized suicide, they sensationalize you know, non-suicidal self-injury. Um, those things really increase the risk factors for, for this generation in particular. Um, and then the availability of means. So we're still really fighting the battle of really talking about managing what is available to kids in the household in particular, and specifically around firearms. Those are the, those are the most commonly used um, method of, of completion, successfully completing suicide. Some of the societal risk factors we talked about is stigma, and we talked about stigma as it relates to um, cultural and ethnic diversity, uh, stigma just in general around just what it means to have a mental, mental health condition, uh, and then again, the unsafe media portrayals of, of, of suicide. And so we'll, we'll Talk a little bit about bullying after this, but there are some things in terms of interpersonally that put kids at risk for suicide. So bullying is one of the big things uh, the, that puts kids at risk for suicide. Uh, we, we've seen on TV, unfortunately, too many times where kids were, were victims of being bullied and, and ended up taking their lives. Um, kids who had uh, trauma are, are at higher risk, uh, child abuse are at higher risk. Um, and then again, we think about the community risk factors is really the biggest one is the barriers to care. So it really is a disservice to talk about the risk factors and not talk about the protective factors. Um, and, and there are many protective factors that are some, some are innate and some, some we can foster. So the strong family and support really important and, and it's a protective factor. Connection to the community and school. And again, I highlighted that because that was one of the things that they weren't able to, to access during, during the pandemic. Um, restriction of means, we have complete control over that within our home. Um, and again, the availability of physical and mental health care that, that was significantly limited in a way that um, really, really compounded an, an, an issue that was already prevalent for people in, uh, of the uh, lower SDS. So again, what can, what can you do? What can you do to help? 
there's this misconception that if you ask your kid, are they having suicidal thoughts, you'll give them the idea and that is completely not true. And so the, what we can do to help is talk. Talk to, talk to our kids about how they're feeling, um, what's going on. If you suspect that they're, they're depressed, ask them. You know, you look, you look a little bit different. You haven't been doing the things that you usually do. I haven't noticed you smile in a couple of days. Are you having thoughts of not wanting to live or are you having suicidal thoughts? You have to ask them directly. Um, and listen to what they say, listen to how they respond. Um, and if you have any doubt, take action, um, despite what they say. You know, parents are the, the expert of, on their kids and they know their kids. Uh, and so if your gut is telling you that something is just not right, take action. Um, don't underestimate the impulsivity of, of, of kids. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen bad things happen, even if it wasn't the intent. Um, so there are lots of resources and, and, and different places to go, but these are the two most common resources, the suicide hotlines. Um, and there are also text crisis lines that, that, are, that are used as well, but this is the one that is the most commonly used. Um, which brings us to bullying. And, and bullying, you guys have talked about bullying in the context of how you prevent bullying. I'm just gonna talk about it in the context of how it relates and links to depression uh, and suicide. And, and we know that people who have been victims of bullying are at risk. What is not talked about as much as kids who are the bullies and, and their risk factor, because they're both at risk for suicidal behavior. And bullying is basically unwanted aggressive behavior. Um, and it can look you know, it can be physical, verbal, social, or in these days, um, electronic or written. So you, you it, sometimes it's just really hard to, for kids to escape someone who's being mean to them. So it's no longer that you know, at the end of the school day, the bell rings, you go home and you're safe. Now you have to worry about, you know, being attacked online uh, by, by your friends or receiving text messages or being attacked publicly in a social, social media platform. And in the bully, in a, in a bullying, I guess, cycle system, there, everyone has a role. So there is the bully and the, the, the victim, everyone knows that person. And then there are people who assist uh, and there are people who reinforce. And then there are the outsiders, which, which the other word for that is the bystanders, the people who do have, a, a, have, a, have something that they can do. And often it's not that they don't wanna do anything, it's that they don't know what they can do. Um, and so this is just like a little depiction of the bullying cycle, kind of what we talked about, um, just the different roles of people. But the, the, role, the role of the, the bystander is to not stand by and watch it. So whether it is to go get help, um, if they feel safe, talk to the bully themselves, but everyone in this system has a role and everyone currently in the way this picture looks, they're, they're colluding with the bully. So kids who bully, and again, I don't think we talk enough about the kids who bully because they're struggling as well. Um, they often want to fit into a group. So maybe they're a group of mean girls at a table being mean to someone and maybe this other person who wouldn't ordinarily be a bully wants to be part of this group and then so, so she joins in. Um, maybe the, the kid is being bullied elsewhere or being mistreated elsewhere. And so in an effort to regain or feel, feel like they have power, they bully someone else. Um, it could be an attempt to, uh, to get attention. Um, some people are just more assertive and impulsive than others. So they come across as bullies. Um, and then some kids just automatically naturally perceive the behavior of others as hostile. And this is really a, 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 a misreading or, or the way that they interpret social cues. Um, and then the younger kids, they just don't necessarily understand how what they do impacts other people. Uh, but I think one of the biggest things to think about when I think about a bully is they have a low self-esteem. And so someone who has a low self-esteem is prone to, to being depressed. And so typically that, that's what, these are the type of kids who will end up um, engaging in bullying. And so the kids who get bullied are another group of kids. And, and really to, to be clear, it, you know, we're in no way trying to blame the victim, but we, what we do want to know is what makes our kids vulnerable. Um, so there, there are some things that, that make certain kids vulnerable to being bullies. And again, kids who misread social cues are vulnerable, kids who look different, um, have an illness or some sort of disability uh, of a different race, or if they're isolated. But I think the, the take home message is anyone who's different really is prone to being bullied. Um, there's also kids who, um, are popular, they get bullied as well. But again, it, it's, it's a little bit different, but, but these are the kids who 
by far and large, the kids who are most vulnerable are being bullied. So again, the successful kids, the intelligent kids, the popular kids, they also get bullied um, by, by kids, again, who have low self-esteem and maybe are, are envious of them and what they're, what they're accomplishing. Um, so they can also be targets. But what you really want to know is what you can do. And so the, it goes back to from the, from the earlier slides is we have to talk to our kids and we have to communicate. Um, if you suspect that your child is being bullied, you know, help them if they want to strategize a plan and cope ahead. So in terms of planning ahead, so when you run into this bully, you know, who are the safe people? You know, who can you talk to? Where can you go? Uh, so again, planning ahead so that they feel empowered to be able to take care of themselves when you're not. Um, there has to be consequences. They have to be meaningful consequences and they have to be limited. Um, but there has to be consequences for someone who's bullying. Um, and and there, there, there should be, if, if safe, you know, an opportunity to repair. So the bully to repair um, in terms of make up for whatever hurt or harm that they've done to the, to the kid that they were bullying. Uh, and there should be monitoring of to making sure that this situation is truly resolved. And then identifying people who can ally with you around resolving this issue uh, is gonna be really important as well. So this is the end of my, my talk really. And I just was gonna go through a couple of slides to talk about and just show you some of the, 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 the resources we have at the Play Center that I think can really be helpful. And again, I talked about self-care and I talked about self-care and I just can't say it enough how important it is. Um, and there's self-care for, we have self-care videos for, for kids of the various ages, which I think could, they, you could find really helpful. Um, oh, didn't mean to play it. Ah. Help me, Sarah. I can't stop it. Okay, let me see. Ah, now I'm playing all of them. Oh my god! I'm just gonna stop it because now I can't figure out how to stop the the, the videos from playing. <laughs> um, but but if you if you go to our website, we have we have a lot of resources around um, supporting your child, taking care of yourself self-care for the caregiver is, is going to be really helpful um, and toolkits to, to use to help um, support and facilitate that. Um, I don't, there really wasn't much else at the end of the slide. Um, okay. Uh, and again, some more websites and resources that we have, but the, and these things you can find really helpful. They're easy to read, um, which, I, which is why I think they, they are so helpful to so many people. Um, and then the hospital itself has resources that can be helpful. And that, that now officially brings me to the very end. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. That, was, that was really a lot of good information. I wanna give people a chance. We'll open it up for questions. You can raise your hand, either physically raise your hand or raise your hand electronically, or you can put a question in the chat, whichever is easier. Doctor, I have a question about schools. When, what's your thought on what the level of response schools want to have? Suppose schools either see things, you know, they notice one kid sitting by themselves in the cafeteria or whatever it is, or they hear things from other kids. What's the, how do they make it, how does a, somebody in a school sort of gauge where they should be in terms of response to that? So that's a tough question. I think it also goes back to what age group we're thinking about. But I think the, the responsibility, the school has a responsibility to be proactive. So not to stand by and see this kid who, you know, is vulnerable and who's isolated um, and just let it be okay. There are tons of things that they can do. Um, but it also has to be in conjunction with what the kid is, is willing to, to go along with as well. But, you know, there are some schools will pair kids up with other kids at lunch who that they know to be nice, you know, warm kids. Um, they can get them involved in activities. 
they can pull them into groups. Some schools have groups, uh, social skills groups, or just social groups where kids can get together and, and just kind of talk about some of the things that are challenging, because there is so much to be learned from one another. Um, but I think at the core, the school has a responsibility to be proactive. Uh, the age of the kid depends, you know, because, you know, the older kids may not want someone to, to quote unquote, fight their battles, but they may need some help navigating the system. They may need some help uh, in learning how to be assertive and asking for what they, what they want, setting limits and boundaries and knowing what they can do if they find that they're in, in a situation where they don't feel safe, who they can go to. So they just might need some help in kind of making that roadmap or plan to be able to address whatever is going on around them. But to, to sit by and do nothing and then to later say, oh, I kind of thought I was worried about that kid, but I, I never, you know, I never thought to, to do anything or, you know, I noticed he was a little bit different than he usually is and not, not do anything is really not okay. And what about another question, Doctor? What about how do you encourage, I think it's easier for parents to envision how to teach your kids to be assertive if they're the person being bullied or not to engage in bullying behavior. But what are your thoughts around the best ways to teach your kids how to be good bystanders? How to intervene for somebody? And assuming that they're physically safe. Right, so, you know, it really is kind of hearing what their thoughts are about what's happening. And I think then you meet them where they are. Um, you know, some kids, like you say, even though they're bystanders, they might feel unsafe. So, so what they can do, how you can create a situation that they're in, so that they feel safe. Um, similar to the other kids, a lot of times we we don't ask because we don't know what to do. So, helping them think about what what the what the options are. So, you know, again, if they felt safe and they they felt comfortable talking to the bully and, and engaging in, in in that way, depending on what's happening. Um, if there's an identified person at school. Um, exploring with them what they feel the barriers are to doing whatever they think is the right step. So a lot of kids worry about, well, if I tell that I'm going to be, you know, not liked by my peers. And so helping them think through that process, um, especially as they get older, you know, I talk to my kids like, so what kind of, what kind of young man do you want to be? You know, what, what does a man of integrity look like? You know, what, what, what's important to you? And so walking through that process and hearing what their fears and concerns and addressing them. And, and at the end of the day, you know, making sure that you are in driving home the point that you're going to be supportive of them and you're, you're there to, to help them navigate the situation. But there's all kinds of different bystander trainings. They're, they're different. They're, there are a million different bystander trainings for, for, for these kinds of things. And, and depending on the kid, again, which, which one is the best fit depends on, 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 how they receive and process information. What do you think, Doctor, about kids coming, you know, getting back together now? Obviously, they're all happy to see each other, but I think everybody notices kids seem much more distracted. And like, what do you do to help kids get more focused and remember like how to talk to each other as opposed to just screen sharing? I mean, so they are so good at the screens and navigating the screens. I, I almost some days feel like, feel like there are other kids in my son's room. And I, and I just, and like they, they sound like they're truly mm -hmm. talking at like the lunch table. Yep. So I don't know that we have to worry so much about that. I think it's really more so the kids who struggle socially um, with those interpersonal skills, you know, at baseline, how do we help them remember some of the tools that they, that they learned um, maybe while, while they were in school. Maybe they were seeing a school counselor and, and getting some help with social skills. Um, but really it kind of goes back to this notion of kind of coping ahead and planning ahead. So in advance of them beginning to interact and engage with, with peers, remembering what their challenges were before and kind of talking through those things and reminding them of some of the skills and strategies that they used before to help them work for them. I think that's going to be a big thing, uh, especially for the kids that are out of practice, because those kids might be kids who didn't really engage as much um, socially through the various like online platforms. So I think it's really, again, knowing your kid and what they struggled with and making sure they feel comfortable and, and talking and, and listening um, to hear what their fears are and what their concerns are about reengaging. 
other questions, comments? Uh, a question in the chat. Um, seems like kids younger and younger are struggling with issues like depression and even thoughts of suicide. Do signs of suicide look younger, look different in younger kids than in teens? So the, the signs are similar in terms of you'll see a dramatic change in their functioning. So if they're, so even younger kids, so they, they maybe no longer enjoy doing the things that, that you guys used to enjoy doing as a family or that you see, they used to enjoy, whether it's a sport, video games, TV, or even reading books, they no longer enjoy those things. Um, they, they're sad and sadness um, looks the same in, in, in older kids and younger kids. Older kids tend, can also be extremely irritable. That can be a real a sign of depression, which you don't see so much in younger kids. Um, you also see um, isolation and withdrawal. They'll be really tearful. They'll talk about, um, you know, not wanting to live and those kinds of things. So, so it's very similar. Uh, younger kids, their concept of death and dying is different in terms of how old they are and the permanence of it. But, but it'll be very similar. Like it'll be a dramatic change in their their former functioning and how they how they behave and how they engage with with you and their peers. Question from the chat, Dr. A. Parents are, can't easily get, if parents who are having a hard time getting mental health services, what can they be doing in the house to manage some of their child's issues, either while they're on a waiting list or between seeing people, that sort of thing? It's an incredible challenge and it, and it, and it is unbelievable how, how difficult it is to get a basic need met. Uh, the one thing I will say is don't forget about your primary care providers because they are the gatekeepers to mental health for, for a lot of families and they can be really useful as a resource. Um, and then outside of that in the home, you know, it's really hard to say what you can do in the home not knowing what is going on. But, but again, I think in listening to your kid and, and, and setting a, a, a space, a safe space to have conversations for them to be able to talk about how they're feeling um, can be really helpful. And then websites like our website and, and uh, can, can help in terms of just some of the tools and strategies that can be helpful. Um, we talked about things like, you know, being active can help lift the mood. So when kids are, are low and depressed and they're sitting around, they're sleeping, that, that really only makes the depression worse. So being active. So the websites can tell you ways in which you can support your kid. Um, I can definitely say most of the things that are, are suggested and recommended when you do them together, you're, you're far more likely to get uh, engagement and to, to be able to be to get buy-in. So in terms of even when we think about like moving around and being active, working out together can be far more engaging uh, and, and even fun together as opposed to, to just telling the kid to go and get on the treadmill. Another question from the chat, how do parents manage, how should parents manage racial trauma? during the summer when kids don't have access to their friends and are somewhat isolated? I don't know if I quite understand that question. So, so I can, we could talk about how to manage um, the stress and the trauma related to race and, and if there's been some, some incident um, and really, again, that goes back to, and I, and I apologize that I sound like a broken record, but it really goes back to talking to your kid and hearing what has been said to them and who has said what and how it made them feel. Um, and most importantly, really reassuring them and, and building them up in terms of, you know, talking about the family narrative, talking about, you know, his, the historical narrative, uh, talking about the resilience of, you know, of, of, uh, of, of your race and, so, and a lot of the positives, um, which, which gives kids, especially kids when they're, when they're dealing with, you know, um, things related to race, it gives them the confidence to be able to stand up and push back because when you're faced with discrimination, it takes away your confidence and self-esteem and it makes you feel inferior and less than. So as a parent, building them up and giving them the tools and resources to say, you know, well, I, I am pretty great and amazing. And, Yes, I'm different and that's okay. Um, but, but giving them the space to talk about that and say that out loud with you will allow them to be able to say that out loud outside of the home, if that answers the question. Any other questions, thoughts? 
Just one, one last one. I mean, do you have any tips on how to get family members, you know, aunts, uncles, grandparents engaged um, to help support a struggling child? So my first question would be, did you ask? Because often I think we, we are waiting for people to, to see us struggling and to offer help. So the first thing I would say is, did you ask? And then the second thing I would say is, you know, again, you are the expert on your child and you want someone to help. It, it would be really helpful to give them some guidance around what is going on and to be transparent about what, what you're concerned about and how you think they can help and have a conversation about what they think that they can do to help. Um, and I think in terms of working with kids and adolescents and young people, consistency is important. And so are they going to be able to do consistently what it is you're asking or what even what it is they're offering um, to do to help? So I think those are the, the, the two biggest things. Did you ask um, and did you give some guidance around what it is you're specifically looking for? And I guess the third thing is really having a dialogue about what, what can actually be done, what can be put in place. Um, I think using extended family is great. Um, you know, it, 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 it's one of the protective factors for some of the other groups who have extended family to be able to, to support the family while one of the parents goes out to work, the, uh, having an adult in the home. You know, when, when uh, the kids are work, doing remote schooling, but you still have to go to work, it's been really helpful and creates a sense of security for the kids as well. So I think using a, extended family is really, really a great idea. Even when sometimes, Doctor, your relationship with that family might be fraught. So maybe you have a, a fraught relationship with your parents, but your parents really can be of help in providing some support or continuity for your kids. So you have to go back and think about how how that's gonna obviously we want to do what's best for our kids, but if it's gonna, you know put you under the bus to, to engage with someone who you find to be toxic, then we have to weigh the risk and benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, can, are you able to limit your exposure to that person? And, and are you able to communicate with them in a way that doesn't really, you know, you know basically knock you off of the bike? Because uh, you are the one who is responsible to taking care of, of your kid and you can't do your job if you're now trying to heal from a, from a negative toxic interaction. So I think it goes back to taking care of yourself, setting lim limits and boundaries and thinking about whether this is doable for you, um, even though you're trying to do it, put it in place for your kid, is, is, it, is it really doable? Um, and maybe are there ways that you can engage this person that can limit your exposure to them? Um, they don't have to come around every day. Maybe it could be for an hour a day or maybe they can come around when you are out shopping, like just thinking about creative ways to limit your exposure. Because it's true, like you, you could have a terrible relationship with a parent, but they could be great grandparents and they can have great relationships with your kids and they can really be helpful. But thinking through making now, now you have to make your own cope ahead plan as to how you would manage that interaction and that engagement. Thank you. Anything else, Megan? Any other? Okay. Doctor, thank you so much. This is incredibly helpful. People have been sending all kinds of messages how helpful they found this. So thank you so much for making time for us. And to everybody else, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you hopefully soon in person as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Stay me. well. Bye-bye.